Hello everybody. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Anatomy. And today let's talk about the anatomy of the facial nerve. So I plan to do the anatomy of the facial nerve in two videos. In the first video, which is this, we will be discussing the nuclei, the cores, both the intracranial and the extracranial, the branches and the supply. In the next video, we will be checking out the lesions of the facial nerve and the clinical correlations as well as the functional components of the facial nerve. So let's move on to the first video. So the facial nerve, as all of you know, is the seventh cranial nerve. It is a mixed cranial nerve, meaning it has both sensory and a motor component. The sensory component is a thinner nerve called the nervous intermedius nerve and uh, the actual motor nerve of the facial nerve, which is the thicker component, is the facial nerve proper. Plus, if you revise or remember your embryology, uh, we know that the facial nerve is the nerve of the second branchial arch. So, when you look at the facial nerve from the gross anatomy point of view, let's see a specimen of the brain stem and we label the parts. We have the midbrain on top, then we have the pons and here we have the medulla. The facial nerve takes off at the pontomedullary junction and that is this area. It is, this is the pontomedullary junction and from here, if you look carefully, that is the facial nerve. And the facial nerve is not traveling alone, it travels along with the vestibular cochlear nerve, which is the eighth cranial nerve. So, seven and eight move together. How do you identify the facial nerve from a frontal section? So, let's label the parts again. Here we have the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. And comparing the previous picture and this picture, you have to find out the facial nerve in the pontal medullary junction. And here we have the facial nerve and the vestibular cochlear nerve. Now let's take a section and see how it looks like or what are the nuclei of the facial nerve. So once you have labeled it, we will take a transverse section at the level of the pontomedullary junction and this is the picture that we get. Uh, what we see behind is the cerebellum. I would ask you to check out my previous video on the cerebellum and if you do that and if you are already read about it or seen it, you would know that these two structures on either side are the cerebellar hemispheres and in front we have the vermis in the midline. The part in front is the pons but before that you can also see the dentate nuclei with its typical crumpled bag appearance and its hilum directed medially. The pons is in front and the two broad structures on either side are the middle cerebellar hemispheres which connect the pons to the cerebellum. Now let's zoom in and see what are the nuclei of the facial nerve. So the facial nerve has a principal nucleus also called the branchiomotor nucleus as you can see over here. That's the red, that's the principal nucleus, just the motor nucleus of the facial nerve. A little medial to that, if you look at the picture now, yes, a little medial to that you can see there are two nuclei over there and those are the parasympathetic nuclei of the facial nerve. It consists of, like I mentioned, two nuclei, a lacrimatory nucleus and the superior salivatory nucleus. So they have two parasympathetic functions. The third nucleus is a special nucleus which the facial nerve shares with two other cranial nerves and that is the nucleus tractus solitarius given here in green, a little lateral to the primary motor nucleus. The nucleus tractus solitarius is the nucleus for taste sensation and if you remember your lesson on the tongue, you know that the taste is carried by the cauda tympani which is a branch of the facial nerve. The glossopharyngeal which is cranial nerve number 9 as well as the vagus which is the cranial nerve number 10 and all these three cranial nerves are taking their taste fibers from the nucleus tractus solitarius. Apart from that we also have the facial nerve getting a bit of sensory fibers from the spinal nucleus and of the trigeminal also but before that let us see how the fibers of the facial nerve form the facial colliculus which has already come on the picture. The fibers from the primary motor nucleus twist around the abducens nucleus given here in grey and that bulge forms the facial colliculus in the floor of the fourth ventricle. Right? And the fibers from the parasympathetic nuclei now go around the primary motor nucleus this way as they form and it is accompanied also by the fibers from the nucleus tractus solitarius. Now, even though these look like I have drawn them in very thin lines, the actual principal motor root is very thick and the sensory roots are actually comparatively thin. The motor root lies medially 
and the sensory roots lie laterally. Let's move on and see what is happening. Now, once the facial nerve leaves the pontomedullary medullary junction, it enters something called the internal acoustic meatus. In this picture, we'll try to label it. Here we have the two internal acoustic meatuses. Uh, we'll zoom it a little and see in close. Yes, here you have the internal acoustic meatus on either side, both of them going laterally. Now, let's see how it looks like from the top view, which is something that you'll need in your practical exams. From the top, the internal acoustic meatus is a little difficult to identify, but you can look for it in the anterior wall of the posterior cranial fossa. I have labeled it for you over here. Those are the internal acoustic meatuses. Now, let's place the pons and the cerebellum and see how the facial nerve enters. So, that is the pons over there and that is how the pons and the cerebellum sits in the posterior cranial fossa. And this is how we have the facial nerve entering the internal acoustic meatus. Now, what is the further course? We are talking about the course of the facial nerve. We have completed the nuclei. We are talking about the course now. Now, let's to understand further about the course, we'll have to see about how the facial nerve is entering the internal acoustic meatus. This is a posterior view. You can see the floor of the fourth ventricle. And this is how it looks like when the facial nerve enters the acoustic meatuses. In the real specimen, this is what it looks like. Here we have the facial nerve. Now, let's see what we can find out about the further course of the facial nerve. Let's zoom in. And now that the facial nerve has entered the petrous part of the temporal bone, which is that V-shaped area over here, that is a V-shaped area, petrous part of the temporal bone. This part of the temporal bone contains the three compartments or chambers of the ear. So, the medial most we have the internal ear over here. That is the internal ear consisting of the cochlea and the semicircular canals. A bit medial to that, we have the box-like middle ear and the lateral most component is the external auditory canal. Now, let's just get rid of the external auditory canal because we are concerned only with the internal ear and the middle ear when it comes to the course of the facial nerve. Now, we have already seen the facial nerve entering the internal acoustic meatus. From here, it enters a canal called the facial canal which exists or extends from the internal acoustic meatus all the way till the exit of the nerve from the stylomastoid foramen. But there is a, a real uh, puzzle as to, not a puzzle actually, it is really different how the facial nerve moves. Let's see how it goes. So once it enters the internal acoustic meatus, the facial nerve passes into the facial canal and it reaches the medial wall of the middle ear as you can see, the medial wall of the middle ear. And this, when it reaches the medial wall of the middle ear, it lies above the cochlea and below the lateral semicircular canal. Once it hits the medial wall of the middle ear, it takes an abrupt 90 degree turn and passes backwards along the same medial wall. So this is how the facial nerve goes. But to see the further course, we'll have to remove the superior semicircular canal and we'll have just the outlines of the lateral and the posterior canal. Let's remove that. Yeah, now we have the superior semicircular canal has disappeared and we can see the lateral semicircular canal and you can see that the facial nerve has moved right across and reached the junction between the medial wall and the posterior wall. Now what happens? So the facial nerve has now got one bend that is the first genu when it hits the medial wall of the middle ear. The next genu is what happens when it passes from the medial wall to the posterior wall. So now the facial nerve bends around the posterior wall, the angle between the medial and the posterior and then follows a smooth curve all the way down till it exits, exits at the silomastoid foramen. So if we were to write the course of the facial nerve in a algorithm or a flowchart format, we can do it this way. It enters through the internal acoustic meatus, it enters the facial canal, it reaches the medial wall of the middle ear. And then here we have the first genu, G-E-N-U meaning bend or knee. And when it is bending here, it lies between the promontory which is below it and the lateral semicircular canal which is above the bend of the facial nerve. It follows backwards, bends around the medial wall onto the posterior wall of the middle ear. Here there is the second genu and then curves down along the posterior wall to exit at the stylomastoid foramen. 
let us look at it from the tympanic membrane side. If you were to look at the course of the facial nerve through a person's ear. So, this is the right facial canal that we are going to see. Let us label the parts that is the petrous temporal bone. You can imagine that you are looking through the right ear of a person. All right. So, this is how it looks like. So, the petrous temporal bone is here and that is the internal acoustic meatus. Coming further towards you, you have the medial wall of the middle ear and here we have the middle ear posterior wall. Now, the facial nerve enters along the internal acoustic meatus, comes all the way towards you now because you are looking through the ear. So, this is how it goes, bends 90 degrees, goes back along the medial wall, around onto the posterior wall and then down and it exits via the stylomastoid foramen as I mentioned thrice already. The relations of the medial wall with relation to the facial nerve, you have the promontory which is the bulge of the cochlea turn a little below the facial genu, the first genu and we have the lateral semicircular canal also causing a bulge on the medial wall which lies above the facial canal and the exit is the stylomastoid foramen. I hope the course is clear. Now, where is the stylomastoid foramen? This is the norma basalis. Let us zoom in and find out the stylomastoid foramen. If you would concentrate around this area, you can see that I have highlighted the stylomastoid foramen. That is the left side and that is the right side. It is a small foramen stylomastoid. It lies between the mastoid processes which is behind it and the two styloid processes which is in front of it. That is why it is called the stylomastoid foramen and that is the foramen through which the facial nerve exits the cranium. Now, the rest of the facial nerve course is described as the extracranial course of the facial nerve and let us see how that goes. The extracranial course for that we have a lateral view of the face and let us superimpose a temporal bone over there so that we can bring out the facial nerve from the stylomastoid foramen. So, once the facial nerve exits the stylomastoid foramen, it immediately gives off three muscular branches. So, three muscular branches are given off immediately. One is to the posterior auricular muscles which are remnants. Then you have a branch going to the stylohyoid and the next one going to the posterior belly of the digastric. So, three muscular branches and only after these three branches are given off does the facial nerve enter the parotid gland. Once it has entered the parotid gland, it divides into two branches, the upper temporofacial trunk and the lower cervicofacial trunk. The course after this, there is a lot of confusion or different texts give different views, but from my reference which is Gray's, what happens is you have a plexus formed here within the parotid gland between these two trunks called the parotid plexus and all the five terminal branches are given off from the parotid plexus. So, there is no clear cut information on these such and such branch coming from the temporofacial or such and such branch coming from the cervicofacial trunk. It is all given off from the parotid plexus. The five terminal branches are given off like this. Superiorly, we have the zygomatic we have the upper and the lower buckle, we have the marginal mandibular and the last one, we have the cervical branch going all the way down. Now, what are the branches within the facial canal? So, the facial nerve, the course is complete, intracranial, extracranial, extracranial it terminates in five branches, that is the end of the course. Now, let us discuss what would happen or what are the different branches of the facial nerve, we will come back to the muscular branches later. First of all, we will see what are the intracranial branches. We can also describe them as branches given off within the facial canal because the facial canal extends from the internal acoustic meatus all the way down to the stylomastoid foramen. The facial canal interestingly is also called the fallopian canal. So, that is a bit of information on the side. So, this is a, a, a representation of the actual angularity followed by the facial nerve as it courses intracranially. So, let us uh, try to place the walls of the middle ear so that we get a better idea of what is happening. What is it? Let us get us ourselves oriented. So, this is the right facial nerve. Here we have the medial wall of the middle ear. I think you are getting an idea. That bulge over there is the promontory. So, the facial nerve is lying above the promontory and on the top posteriorly you have the bulge of the lateral semicircular canal. Now, let us place the posterior wall of the middle ear also. So, now we have a better idea of what is happening. The first branch given off 
by the facial nerve is given off at the genu and that is the greater petrosal nerve. So the genu of the facial nerve, the first genu, the first 90 degree bend has a swelling over there and that is called the geniculate ganglion and the greater petrosal nerve is given off at the geniculate ganglion. The next branch is given off at a structure called the pyramid which is seen at the junction of the medial wall and the posterior wall. Okay, and that branch actually enters into the middle ear cavity to supply the stapedius muscle which is attached to the stapes, the third ear ossicle or the tiniest ear ossicle. So that branch is next and that is the nerve to stapedius. It innervates the stapedius muscle. The third branch within the facial canal also passes into the middle ear cavity and that is our cauda tympani. It is given off much lower in the course but still above the stylomastoid foramen very much within the middle ear cavity. So these are the three branches in the facial canal. What does the greater petrosal nerve do? It supplies tear producing fibers to the lacrimal gland. So that is the nerve responsible for your crying response. It also supplies a few mucous glands in the nasopharynx and the nasal cavity also. The nerve to stapedius, as we mentioned, supplies the stapedius muscle which is attached to the stapes and this is the muscle responsible for the stapedial reflex which protects the inner ear from loud nose damage, loud noise damage. Now the cauda tympani is responsible for carrying taste fibers to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue as well as it supplies um, salivary fibers to the submandibular and the sublingual salivary glands. Okay, after exiting, we have already seen the branches. All of them supply muscles of facial expression and the other three muscles given off immediately after exiting. So at its exit, there are three branches. All three are muscular branches. We have already seen those muscles. Auricular muscles, stylohyoid and the posterior belly of the digastric. Terminal branches are five. Temporal branch, zygomatic branch, buccal branch, upper and lower. They are called upper and lower in relation to the parotid duct. Lying upper to the parotid duct, you have the upper buccal branch. And below the parotid duct, you have the lower buccal branch. And then we have the marginal mandibular, as its name suggests, passing along the margin of the mandible. And lastly, we have the cervical branch. So with that, we come to the end of our first video. And please stay tuned for the next one, where we'll be discussing the lesions, how to localize the lesions, as well as the functional components of the facial nerve. So till then, take care. Thank you.